Um, fantastic. Well, a warm uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, this is a, uh, <clears throat> a webinar on uh, legacy disputes. Um, we've got uh, four uh, guest speakers uh, today, which I will introduce uh, shortly. Uh, but this topic has come about uh, because um, you hopefully will have noticed there's been a huge uh, increase in legacy income coming to the sector uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, roughly over about 10% a year increase. And it's due to increase even further in the next 10 years with another 66% uh, growth. Um, whilst this is very welcome news for the sector, uh, what we are seeing is a huge increase in the number of um, disputed or challenged legacies, uh, roughly around a third. Um, so disputes uh, can be problematic. Um, there's a careful balance that needs to be drawn by the charity in terms of risk reward, cost benefit, reputational PR, and legacies, as uh, the finance people among us as will know, uh, are often significant in, in, in value uh, and can make income profiles quite volatile and challenge, challenges and disputes um, often uh, factor into that as well. So we have a great uh, array of speakers today. Uh, the aim is to give you uh, some legal accounting, governance and risk aspects um, of, of managing these disputes. So hopefully there's plenty of takeaways uh, for you to get. We're going to start off um, with um, oh, uh, Alice uh, Unwin uh, from BDB Pitmans, who's going to uh, talk to us about uh, the legal uh, aspects that trustees need to consider. Uh, then you're back with me. Uh, I'm Stuart. I'm a partner at MHA. Uh, I'm going to be looking at the uh, accounting requirements and considerations of legacies and, and how that will impact when disputes arise. Then we're going to go over to, to Karen Bradshaw, who's the CEO of uh, the Charity Finance Group, who's going to be talking about governance and risk implications. And then uh, we will round off with uh, Lucinda uh, from, again, from BDB Pittman, who's a, a partner there, uh, talking about uh, mitigating and litigating uh, about legacies. Uh, so um, a little bit of ad admin. Uh, this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be available on all of our websites uh, in the coming days after it to share with your colleagues if you so wish. Uh, there is a Q&A function uh, in the, uh, the, the Zoom menu. Uh, please do feel free uh, to write uh, any questions that you have uh, in that box uh, as we go along. Uh, we probably won't be stopping for questions uh, individually because we've got quite a bit to cover, but there is a Q&A session uh, at the end where we will pick up on all of your questions. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Alice. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, as Stuart mentioned, um, I specialise in charity law at BDB Pittman's. And I suppose for those of you on the call who don't know us, we're, we're a law firm and our charity teams provide sort of wraparound legal support to charities throughout the whole life cycle. So I suppose in that way, we're the sort of mirror image of MHA. And it's very nice to speak to you all today. Now, I've listed on this on this next slide the charity law duties that are particularly relevant um, and which should underpin all of your decisions and actions in relation to legacy disputes and before that in relation to how you map out and handle legacies in the broader context of your fundraising activities. Of course, it's the charity trustees on this call or on your board who will be directly subject to these legal duties, but they are also relevant and important to bear in mind for charity management and those of you in fundraising teams. As a charity lawyer, uh, you'd expect me to say and to encourage you to, in some way, go back to basics and to consider your key legal duties when looking at how you manage potential legacy, legacy disputes um, and how you go about all of your business. But I think this point is particularly relevant to legacy disputes because we are often dealing with highly charged emotional situations. And by going back to the basics and reminding yourself of what your charities key overarching objectives are underpinned by these charity law duties can sometimes help put matters in perspective and cut through some of the emotion potentially with the results that your trustees um, and that the charity feels emboldened and justified in taking perhaps what might be a more sort of assertive stance in relation to protecting legacies than they would otherwise. 
So first on the list, I've put here the duty of your trustees to act in the best interests of the charity. Fairly obvious duty, you might think, but one that, that shouldn't sort of be, be lost in the noise of things. Um, the duty is focused on the need to promote your charity's charitable purposes. Right back to basics, what are your charity's objectives as set out in your constitution? And does the decision at hand and, and do your actions support and further your core objectives? Relevant here also is how you and your team have articulated those charity objectives in your broader mission and in the values of your charity. And is it the case that the way you communicate with uh, testators and, and fundraise and handle legacy disputes, do, uh, does your approach mirror and reflect your charity's values? Now, when looking at what's in the best interests of your charity, we're not just looking at the short term immediate interests of your charity, the here and now, but the but also, and perhaps more importantly, the longer term interests of your charity and its viability and its success in the future. Your charity's reputation here is, an import, is important, but what's really at the core of this duty is the interests of your current and your future beneficiaries. Um, and it's this that should really drive legacy decisions and, and drive how you work out what's in the best interests of your, of your charity. Second on the list um, is a duty to protect and secure your charity's assets. Now, Stuart's going to have a look a little bit later at the sort of accountancy nuances and framework, but for these purposes, um, assets are going to include a legacy that has been pledged to you, even if it hasn't been sort of confirmed and paid out to you. And so you have a duty to, to protect that. Charity trustees, and with that, the charity as a whole, also has really a, a duty to act with reasonable care and skill. And that means ensuring that you are properly informed about the matter at hand. And that can involve, if necessary, obtaining external advice to ensure that everyone is sufficiently informed. As with all things, trustees and charities have a duty to comply with relevant law um, and act within the bounds of your constitution. And it's worth mentioning here in terms of relevant law, the importance of data protection regulation, given that you will be handling personal data of of potential donors. And you may have in fact collected that data and started those communications um, and stored that information quite a long time ago. And lastly, um, on this list is your duty of prudence, which is the term used to describe the duty that trustees have to manage the resources and the assets of the charity responsibly, responsibly and to act reasonably and honestly. And compliance with this duty can involve or does involve really avoiding exposing the charity's assets, its reputation and its beneficiaries to undue risk. And risk is something that Karen is going to take a sort of deeper dive into later on. Now, both Lucy and Karen will look at um, how in practice these duties are applied when making and handling legacy claims, but we thought I would first provide a few sort of broad pointers. And those are laid out or some of the things I want to cover are laid out on this next slide. And the first is um, so, Stu, if you can move to the next slide, please, is, is about decision making. You may be making as a charity some fairly important decisions, um, particularly if considering sort of going down the route of a, of, a, of a legacy claim. And we would always encourage you and your board, if, if, if they're involved, to make sure that they have not just looked at the option in front of them and presented to them, um, but all of the alternative courses of action, um, all of the different options, and that they have um, properly justified to themselves uh, why the chosen course of action furthers the and is in the best interests of your charity. Back to that first duty in furtherance of your charitable objects. Um, 
again, and that's relevant to the duty I talked about, reasonable care and skill, is making sure that um, if necessary, when making that decision, that if you don't have um, sufficient in-house expertise to deal with the matter at hand, that you, you obtain the benefit of professional advice. And also, as with all decisions, that as a charity, if um, people involved are subject to a potential conflict of interest, that that conflict is managed appropriately. And I'm a governance, bit of a governance geek, so you'd expect me to say this, but really important is having, whether it's a board making a decision or members of your fundraising team or management, making sure you've got a very robust governance and decision making audit trail that you can point to um, if things go awry a little bit further, further down the line. Now, decisions are much easier to make and much more objective if you can ground them in pre-existing policies that the charity has adopted and that can be used to help guide you through the decision-making process in, in relation to a potential legacy dispute. Uh, so it's, it's always worth before the event and before you realize there's a, go there's a gap or a hole, which is often what happens with people, um, worth dusting off and, and, and pulling off the shelf, so to speak, policies that your charity has that may be relevant to this area, whether that's your fundraising policy or, for example, your acceptance and refusal of donations policy and seeing how those policies address the question of legacies and legacy disputes. I wanted briefly to mention ex gratia payments, and that's because in limited circumstances, your charity may decide rather than to pursue a legacy, but to in fact forgo a legacy entitlement um, in favour of, for example, a, a, a a relative of the deceased who uh, has perhaps missed out um, or, or under the will. And where that's the case and where you're thinking of making a fairly big decision like that in unusual circumstances, but they're always the decisions that get the press, that decision will require the prior consent of the Charity Commission, as I'm sure you're aware. And it's worth noting that the Charities Act 2022 will slightly change the law in relation to ex gratia payments. In brief, um, the test in relation to ex gratia payments is going to change from the current subjective test, i.e. do the individual personal trustees feel that they have a moral obligation to forgo that legacy title entitlement to an objective test which um, may make it a little bit easier, actually sort of depersonalizes it. Um, in addition, the Act will clarify that when making ex gratia payment decisions, those can be made by charity staff rather than the board, which should, from a sort of practical perspective, make, make life a little bit easier. Um, and also there's going to be a de minimis under which you'll be able to make ex gratia payment decisions without having to go to the commission for their prior consent. So probably some quite helpful changes and they will come in um, likely this autumn. So moving to the next slide, please. Before I hand back to Stuart, I just wanted to mention some key regulatory guidance in this area. The first of which um, is, of course, the Charity Commission's guidance in relation to legacies, which really emphasises this point, the point that I made earlier as to the fact that it's the trustees who have a key and overriding duty to act in the best interest of the charity and it's that which should which should guide all decisions in relation to legacy disputes the commission also has some helpful guidance um, in relation to litigation which should of course be read if you are sort of going down the route of a, uh, of a sort of legacy claim, legacy dispute. And Lucy, a little bit later, is going to talk about how the tone of that guidance when it was last updated slightly shifted, um, probably quite helpfully for charities. And lastly, there's the fundraising regulators guidance. This is broad guidance and code of conduct relevant to all fundraising matters, but it has some useful um, tips really in relation to legacies, in particular, the importance of the approach in your communications This is before a legacy dispute with um, a testator. So, you know, how you continue that 
continue that relationship and those communications and keep that door open. Um, and also a helpful reminder of the importance of where a testator has required that their gift be acknowledged public in a particular way that, that you bear that into in mind. So their guidance is more relevant to, to legacy fundraising in general rather than to legacy disputes. So I've given you a sort of quick trot through uh, legal duties and key regulatory guidance, and I'm now going to hand back to Stu. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alice. That's brilliant. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going. You have to excuse me. I do have a little cough today. Um, so I'm going to talk about some uh, accounting uh, requirements. Um, uh, specifically, it's a it's an area that sometimes is not well enjoyed uh, by some uh, simply because it's quite subjective and is judgmental. And so it's a key area of, of, of estimate uh, that goes within the accounts and therefore it leads to elements of uh, uncertainty. So what I'm going to cover is a, a quick uh, recap of, of income recognition criteria overall. Uh, what the SORP says, uh, which is the Statement of Recommended Practice uh, about uh, legacies in particular and how that uh, those like income recognition criteria should be applied to legacies. And then I'll cover some practical examples. Um, so hopefully this uh, wheel is, is relatively familiar to, to most of you. These are the, the three criteria required uh, to recognise uh, income uh, in the financial statements. Uh, it is loosely entitlement, which is the control of rights over the access to economic benefits. Uh, we have measurement, which in my eyes is always a reliable measurement uh, of the value or the amount and the cost to complete. Uh, and then we have probability, uh, which uh, changed <clears throat> um, a, a few years back, um, uh, quite a while actually ago, uh, to from virtually certain to now uh, more likely than not. So that is the probable uh, inflow of uh, economic benefits, which is now meeting that 51% test of more likely than not. Um, so how is this interpreted in the sort? Well, there's a raft of um, paragraphs and uh, um, information in there uh, telling you uh, essentially how to interpret it, uh, starting at section 5.29 and uh, ending around about uh, 5.35. So let's just take a look at uh, some of those uh, in a bit more detail and let's see how it uh, in, uh, applies to it. So when we talk about entitlement, um, where I'd go with this one is it essentially it's that control over the rights or the access to economic benefits. So uh, the sort's quite clear. Uh, this cannot arise without knowing both that there is a valid will and the death of the benefactor. Um, so this goes back to something Alice was saying about actually your legal duties start when a pledge is made, not when you're, but that's not when you uh, account for it because pledge it, pledges and intentions uh, are not sufficient uh, to meet the entitlement criteria. Then we come to the next point, uh, which is about entitlement exists when the executor of uh, the estate uh, is satisfied that the property in question uh, is sufficient um, and, and to, to, to basically satisfy the claims on the, the estate. And this is the first nod we see in the SORP where we talk about the involvement of the executors of the will. And this is something that I'll be laboring on quite heavily uh, because actually, um, and probably Lucy will pick up with it too, interaction with the executives of the will is actually quite key uh, in looking at the income recognition criteria, but also in terms of managing the dispute as well. Um, we also need to remind you that essentially it's three uh, of these criteria you, you require, entitlement, probability and measurement. So entitlement on its own is insufficient to recognise legacy income. When we talk about probability, before we talked about that's the more likely than not test, the 51%, the sort comes to this uh, <laughs> rather annoying wording uh, because it says it's normally probable when. So normally it's not very a, a definitive statement. Um, and I do think it, it could be a little bit more helpful if the sort was a bit more clear on these uh, matters. But it says normally probable when you have the granting of probate that the executors have established uh, that there are sufficient uh, assets in the estate to pay the legacy and that there are no conditions attached to the legacy. Um, well, any conditions that are attached to the legacy are either in the control of the charity or have been met. The classic example of that latter one is a life tenant. Um, they would need to be deceased in order uh, for you to, to recognise um, the legacy in there. We move over to measurement, and this comes back to the reliable uh, measurement uh, of the amount or the value and the costs uh, to actually complete the legacy. So this is where real uh, elements of judgment comes in. 
um, it is that reliable estimate and that is uh, essentially reliability is, is a huge area of judgment and very subjective. So um, it is the trustees ability to make a reliable estimate and that needs to be their measurement or estimate of fair value of the cash that is going to be distributed. Just a note there that it's fair value. Um, so if you're expecting a legacy to, to be distributed over more than one year, you may need to consider discounting um, uh, if, if that's material. And just be aware that there's a must here. Um, so where you don't adopt the portfolio approach um, and you've got an individual uh, material legacy, this you must be able, you can achieve measurement that must happen when the executors of the uh, estate the, agree the accounts or that they notify uh, the charity of a distribution. Um, so just be aware of, of that being a must. So where do we come to uh, in terms of issues and practicalities? Um, uncertainty uh, does arise when you have uh, a challenge uh, or indeed if the, the actual uh, legacy itself is a residuary legacy because there are a number of uh, moving parts to that legacy in terms of potentially uh, asset valuations, uh, the satisfactory um, um, payment of all the liabilities against the estate and therefore sometimes creating a reliable estimate and a re residual legacy is quite difficult. Um, where measurement cannot be made, a reliable measurement cannot be made, you will still, it providing entitlement uh, and probability have been met, you will meet the criteria of a contingent asset just be aware you don't recognize a contingent asset, you simply disclose it. So you'd write it in the notes to the accounts that say we are aware uh, of a legacy, uh, but we're unable to create a reliable measurement uh, at this point in time. Where does this come in most practicalities is throughout those three criteria, I've talked about uh, the executors in every single last one of them. Um, so in my eyes, it's always absolutely key uh, to engage with the executors because they can actually help you um, understand and actually make judgments on all three of those because for entitlement we talked about um, the executors must be satisfied that the, um, that the charity will get funds when it came to probability uh, we said that the executors had to confirm uh, or conclude that, that there were sufficient assets uh, in order to make a distribution and in measurement we said there was a, a must there in terms of estate accounts or confirming that a distribution has been made so always, always, always interact with the executors. Just be aware a couple of um, very annoying uh, elements that can happen with legacies. Sometimes you can over accrue or indeed uh, if you've discounted uh, a legacy because of the time value of money, be aware unwinding of discounts go against the income, not expenditure. And if you impair a legacy debtor, as in you in year one, you think you're going to, uh, uh, you over accrue for that legacy. In year two, when it, it you, understand more information that actually lowers the value uh, that impairment goes against legacy income not expenditure hence you can sometimes arrive at negative income which doesn't look very pretty in the accounts always be aware about post balance sheet events and these cause um, charities numbers of problems because having to keep the accounts open longer than they need to um, before uh, approving them can cause problems again here a post balance sheet event if you are notified uh, or receive uh, a payment um, after the year end, um, and it's clear that those ex the executives of the accounts have actually made the decision to make that payment before the year end, that is an, an adjusting post balance sheet event. So you would uh, restate the accounts for that before they are signed off. So again, if you make contact with the executives of the estate before the year end and ask them whether they are in a position uh, to either con confirm that a payment uh, will or will not be made, then actually you can satisfy that criteria earlier on. One last little bit that I just wanted to talk about is a portfolio approach. Uh, this came through uh, in the latest edition of the SORB a number of years ago. Um, this is a portfolio approach where you have a, a charity has a large number or a significant number of uh, individual small legacies that are not material on their own, you can adopt uh, an estimation uh, technique across uh, the broad spectrum of these legacies. There's no need to, to perform exact uh, reliable measurements on each individual legacy. You can take a broader view uh, of the legacy uh, of that portfolio uh, in arriving at accruing a debtor. Um, it's just there for your advantage.
So I'm now going to pass over uh, to Karen, who's going to talk to us about the risk aspects. Thanks, Stu. Um, so I'm Karen Bradshaw. I'm the Chief Executive of Charity Finance Group, for, which for those of you who are not familiar with the organisation is what you would call an infrastructure organisation. We're a membership organisation and essentially we exist to try and drive up the standards of charity finance um, and accounting. Uh, and risk falls very firmly into that area. You've heard two really detailed, very uh, helpful and practical information that is really knowledge giving and my session is going to be a slightly different what I hope to do is is kind of provoke you into thinking slightly differently about risk and before I go into into the meat of, of what I'm going to say I, th I think I would like to to point out that that I'm not going to suddenly give you lots of heat maps or, or techniques or swim lanes to be able to assess and and uh, fill in your risk registers around this for me the best risk management is about thinking, about dialogue, about decision making, and, and good risk management helps you navigate the, the various uh, risks that you encounter during the course of, of your day-to-day -day work for your charity. Could I have the next slide, please, Stu? So I'm a very visual person, um, and my uh, these, these are, you'll be pleased to know, copyright-free pictures that are, are taken off my iPhone. Um, the first one, let's go at the, at the top about the uncertainty. So the first thing for me around um, the risk, particularly in a dispute situation, is, is, is the uncertainty. We all know that planning is really important, particularly from an accounting perspective and from a risk management perspective. And uncertainty can be a real um, underminer of, of that, that um, process. And when we're talking about disputes, we, we are talking about a number of different areas of uncertainty. The first being financial uncertainty. You don't know what you're likely to get out of this. You don't know whether or not the uh, sum of money is going to go up or down. You don't know whether you're going to uh, have a ne negative impact on, on the position and have to undertake some of the steps that Stu was saying about unraveling. So there's some financial uncertainty there. The second bit is, is about reputation. And I will come back onto, onto the reputational piece um, a little bit later, because for me, reputation can be one of those that we disproportionately um, approach in, in terms of risk, particularly from a governance perspective. Um, and that leads me into the last one of, of that uncertainty piece, which is around risk appetite. Now, when we talk about risk appetite, we tend to think of it as being something that you can put around a whole of a board or a whole of an exec team. But the reality is what you're really looking at is probably between six and 12, depending on how many trustees you've got, different risk appetites that may um, overlap or may be shared, but actually they're all slightly different and, and there will be nuances in, in how individuals approach a particular given decision that they are called upon to, to answer. And it's the same with the executive. And between the executive and, and the, the governance structure can be also different. So you've got real uncertainty regarding that risk appetite. So let's move on to the operational bit, bit at the bottom, uh, in, the, in the bottom of that slide. So I talked about planning and processing being really difficult when you have uncertainty, but actually it's also the thing that can really help you with uncertainty because it will enable you to think through different scenarios. Now, in terms of risk management, you wouldn't want to be spending so much time trying to plan and scenario, um, go through different scenarios that you end up spending more time doing the planning than actually doing the thing. Uh, so it is about reaching a balance. It's about recognizing that you can um, over engineer something and sometimes you just need to get on with 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 the issue um, you need, a good enough guess is a good enough guess a good enough plan is is what you need um, but you can you can look at your plans and processes and you do need to review those if you end up with a dispute situation thinking about disclosures in your annual report there's some practical elements to what we were just hearing so you heard Stu talk about needing to perhaps restate in some circumstances or continued assets that need to be explained in the notes to the accounts. But we often forget the front end of, of the uh, trustees annual report and accounts. That's the bit where you have the opportunity to tell your story. And the reason why this is really important in risk management terms is that it enables you to give out that information that balances how somebody might read a, a situation. So if you're in a particular a tricky reputational situation, telling the story of your, um, your duties that Alice was talking about at the beginning or your approach to something or the decisions that you've made can help both with funders, with beneficiaries, and also importantly with, with other donors and stakeholders. 
So that's a really important area. And then finally, on the operational side, there are the accounting policies and assumptions that you've made um, that Stu was talking about. But I just want to flag up COVID because obviously we know that practically some of the, um, the, the processing of, of uh, legacies has been delayed by the COVID um, crisis that we've gone through. And that can uh, cause you to, to need to review some of those accounting policies and assumptions. Moving across to the funding side of things. So of course, there are risks around perceptions of funders. So if you are suddenly looking like you're going to be in receipt of, of a, a large sum of money, that may undermine um, a, a funder that's standing in the wings thinking that you are someone that needs to receive or a charity that needs to receive funds from them. And therefore there is that perceptional piece, uh, perception piece about, about uh, disputes, particularly where, where you then are at risk of losing some of that money. But conversely, hard going hard after some money when the reputational downside of, of that, if you don't get that balance right, that can also impact those individuals' willingness to give you money. You don't want to be the one that's on the front of the proverbial uh, red top newspaper. Another risk is around cash flow and cash flow management. So if you are expecting some money in, but you then are aware of a dispute, that can throw your whole presumptions around cash flow out of kilter. And, and that is something that needs to be thought about. And then finally, you will, I'm not going to labor this one because I think Lucy's going to talk much more detail about this and give you some case studies around managing that risk of cost versus benefit. When are you throwing good money after bad? Or when are you pulling away actually uh, from practical um, applications that might be short of a full litigation that give you the benefits uh, of, of that legacy? So if I can have my final slide, please, Stu. So for many of you, you'll be wondering who on earth is this individual and why am I mentioning him? But I think it's a really good uh, illustration. And if you've not read, uh, not watched the TED talk by this wonderfully named individual, Gerd Gigerenza, um, on risk literacy, I really would recommend it to you. And basically what he says within this, spoiler alert, sorry. Um, what he says within this is that we, we have an emotional reaction to risk and sometimes we can overshoot that reaction. So our perception and reality get out of kilter. And the example that he gives is, is America in, after 9-11. A whole load of Americans decided that the risk of flying into um, country, um, internal flights was too high because of, of potentially the risk of death. So they stopped doing that and instead switched to long haul driving. And what they, they were able to see was that the number of individuals killed on the roads actually spiked up by about, I think it was 16, 1800, something like that. Whereas the, the number of people that actually died on planes was zero in that same period of time. So that perception of the risk that we are uh, exposed to can sometimes overshoot and lead us to greater danger and greater risks if we're not standing back and thinking about things in a less emotional way. And I think Alice's comments about taking the emotion out of things was, were really, really helpful. So thinking about how you manage those short term, long term, different competing risks, it is about stepping back and looking at it from a real point of view as opposed to a perceived point of view. Manage the assumptions that are surrounding the, the various different parts of this. If you think of this as one of those complicated puzzles where all the pieces sit together and then you push them and they slot in. If you haven't got one of those pieces together, you can not You can sometimes miss getting that, that uh, full picture together. I've, I've already talked about appetite for risk, so I won't go back to that, but short-term and long-term, this isn't just about managing the risks that exist for today. As Alice said, it's about the longer-term risks as well. And it may be that what you think is going to, to uh, re reduce or mitigate your harm right now might actually cause you a bigger problem down the line. So it's that, that discussion and decision making and standing back around those short term and long term. And then think about the relative risks, the cash versus ca and, and cash flow, the, the reputational risks, the management of time and resources. And then just a final, final message to, to give you again, please don't think of risk management as being filling in your charts and waiting and scoring stuff. It is about the richness of the conversations. It is about having those practical decision making um, with the right information in front of you and standing back and coming to a collective uh, decision. And remember that risk management is something that's only ever judged in the cold light of failure. So you're only ever going to look at whether or not you did well after the event and often if it's gone bad. So don't don't please um, uh, hang back from risk management. 
with on the basis that you you think that you are um, not able to to have those decisions and come to that decision making. I'm going to stop there and pass over to Lucy. Thanks ever so much, Karen, for those very practical points. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lucinda Brown, and I lead the Will and Trust Disputes team for BDB Pitmans. And um, it's certainly uh, correct to say that legacies and wills continue to remain a fundraising cornerstone for charities. Legacy Foresight and other publications have widely reported that the pandemic has caused charities to get better at legacy promotion. And a huge amount of work has been going on. I know that. Um, one of the threats, though, to undoing that good work is claims against the estate of a donor or testator. And we can perhaps expect that as the number of donations to charity made through legacies and wills uh, increases, as it is doing, so will the number of disputes relating to those legacies, uh, which can arise in a number of ways. Um, you'll all be familiar with the types of legacy disputes that arise, no doubt, but just to canter through those, there might be a claim brought which disputes the validity of a will under which the charity stands to benefit and a claimant is seeking to overturn that will. So that is an either or situation. Either the will is valid or it's not. And the risk is that if the claim is successful, the legacy may fall away entirely. Alternatively, a claim might be brought by a disappointed family member or other person who is dependent on the deceased during their lifetime. Or there might be a claim which disputes the correct interpretation of the terms of the will. So all of those scenarios might threaten the legacies on which charities are so dependent. Could I have the next slide, please, Stu? Oh, I think we've just, there we go. Perfect. So just to flag up some steps, I think it'd be helpful to look at some steps that you can take uh, during the lifetime of the donor to mitigate the prospects of a claim being brought in the first place. Um, some of these I've listed on the slide and I'll run through these in quite short order. But it's essential, and I appreciate you won't always have control of this, but where possible, it's essential to ensure, and I would say this, wouldn't I, that a will is prepared by an experienced will draftsman. And there are various reasons for this. It's imperative to ensure the legacy is expressed in clear and unequivocal terms. It might sound simple, but it's really not always easy to achieve. An example of a recent case I dealt with was where a donor had left her most valuable asset, which is her home as a property in a very nice part of London to our client's charity under her will. And our client was a, a hospital who had given her husband treatment over a number of years. So she felt very keenly that the hospital should be the principal beneficiary of her estate. And the residue of her estate was to be divided between three other charities. The donor lost capacity following the drawing up of the will and her home had to be sold to pay for her care home fees, which again regularly happens, and she moved to live in a care home permanently. So the gift to our client under her will would have failed on her death as the donor no longer owned the property. And a simple saving provision of including the words the property or the proceeds of sale representing it would have um, assisted the position here for our clients if they'd been included in the will, instead of simply making reference to the property itself. But um, happily in this case, the donor's attorneys were able to apply for a statutory will on her behalf. And that's a process through which the Court of Protection um, can endorse the terms of a will if it's satisfied that um, the statutory will would more accurately represent the donor's wishes if they retained capacity. Um, and given the changed circumstances. So through that process, we were able to give our client charity a voice and agree with the other three charities who were the residuary beneficiaries taking a lesser share of the estate that um, our client should take a proportion of the residue which was equivalent to the value of the intended gift. So that enabled us to agree that we should receive the majority of the residuary estate because obviously the proceeds of sale fell into residue following the sale of the property. So the application in that case was brought by the attorneys and was considered to be in the donor's best interests um, because it, this is what she would want to happen. We were able to satisfy the court that this, this will, the new will was the, what she would want to happen given the changed circumstances. And I'm pleased to say it was just a case of sending one detailed letter of sort of three sides of A4 to the Court of Protection on this issue, which made a difference of over a quarter of a million pounds for our client charity. So an example of cost effectiveness and the ways in which these disputes can be resolved cost effectively. 
Always ensure that the drafting of the will caters for a change in your charity's name or a merger of your charity. Include the charity number in the drafting and its name in registered office so there's no ambiguity. Don't um, be tempted, I'm afraid, to get involved in the will drafting yourselves. I'm sure that um, most of you won't, but there's certainly perhaps more emphasis in the current climate on offering will writing support to donors and potential donors. And some charities, I'm aware, sort of signpost donors to free will services. A little bit risky, in my view. I think the problem with those situations is that um, sometimes, uh, well, certainly will writers don't tend to do as thorough a job as a, as a solicitor um, that's sort of step qualified. Um, and that post death, there won't be then any detailed attendance notes recording the testator's intentions. And as a litigator, you know, and, and all litigators uh, will, will sort of agree. Yeah, the attendance notes of what the donor wanted to achieve will carry a lot of weight post death and you're just not going to get that sort of um, detail if free services are used. Um, I think it's really important to see the communication with donors as a lifelong endeavour and to talk to the donor about their intentions while they're alive and document their wishes while you can. Um, it's certainly the case that if a charity is able to demonstrate a close association or even an association with the donor, there's generally a better prospect of the charity being able to preserve the legacy intended for it. Um, on a 1975 Act claim, which is a claim where an adult child or, or somebody who's being maintained or a other family member brings a claim saying that the will does not make adequate provision for them, um, a Supreme Court authority, which confirms that um, the testator's wishes won't be disturbed lightly by the court, even where it's um, a charity's interests that are going to be affected, and even where you know that legacy does represent a windfall for the charity. Um, but it, it's certainly not the case that just because it represents a windfall, um, that the, the court won't have in mind the fact that any order under the 1975 Act will disturb the provision for charity that was intended. So it's certainly the case to say, you know, although your charity might not have a basis for saying there's a there's a needs based defence here, so we have a need for provision from this estate, if they can show a close association with the donor, that will carry weight with the court. Um, linking in with donors at key times in their lives, um, when they're getting married, when they're um, uh, having children, all the sort of major life events are key times to link in with donors to um, remind them that they might consider updating their will. Encourage the donor to talk to the family, their family, about the intended gift to the charity, particularly if the gift is significant. Certainly a catalyst for disputes is this element of surprise that arises occasionally on death. Um, getting things out in the open during the lifetime is always preferable. The family then have um, time to come to terms with it if they've had chance to discuss the decision to benefit charity substantially with the donor during the lifetime. Um, Stu has already alluded to this, as has Karen, but it's really key um, when you find out that you are a beneficiary of an estate to make early contact with the executives of the estate become, uh, upon becoming aware of your um, charity's interest. Um, there is sometimes a gap between notification to the charity of the legacy um, or a gap between you know, finding out the extent of the legacy and some executors don't immediately consult with charities who are often residuary beneficiaries under the will. Um, you know, I've seen cases where uh, executives have gone off and sort of dealt with the state assets in a way that doesn't um, preserve for the charity the maximum benefit. And so have your teams on this correspondence with the executors as soon as possible. If you're a residuary beneficiary, um, a firm for solicitors, although it may act for the executors, does owe you duties as a residuary beneficiary. You, you know, press for the information that you need, require the executors to tell you what is happening, what is going on, what steps they are taking in the administration of the estate, and, and be a bit of a nuisance until you get the answers. Next slide, please, Stu. Um, I think if claims arise, which they do, um, there are special considerations for charitable trustees um, when faced with a claim against the estate. Um, claims, as we've already talked about, pose litigation cost risks for charities that do need to be very carefully managed. But I would, wanted to encourage those on the call today to, to reassure that the costs can be carefully managed if the right approach is taken. Um, I think there's some statistics out there that suggest that the average value of a legacy left in a will is between 3,000 and 30,000 pounds. So at that sort of level, 
the costs incurred in defending a claim might easily exceed the value of the legacy, of course. But if other charities receive legacies of a similar size, a cost effective defence can be mounted on behalf of all affected charities by teaming up and sharing the costs. But um, you know, in situations where the legacies are higher than that and the interest is, is much more significant, um, a careful balance still needs to be struck between a charity's duty to preserve the assets intended for it against the costs, and by costs I mean both legal costs, but also your internal management time costs of, de of defending the claim. And as Alice alluded to, it's there's certainly been a shift in the Charity Commission guidance in recent years as to how charities should approach claims. Um, and sometimes the charity will either, you know, charity isn't always the, the defendant to the potential claim. It might need to actually press the litigation to secure for itself the asset or the legacy. Um, the guidance in 2010 was phrased in terms which said, litigation can damage a charity's reputation and this can impact upon its ability to further its objects effectively if the beneficiaries lose confidence in its service or the charity's ability to raise funds if donors are concerned that funds will be spent on litigation but i think since then um, there has been a softening of this approach i think you know the rspca and gill case was this sort of frightening case where you know pr was a major issue which obviously does need to still be in the minds of your boards but I think, you know, the emphasis really now under the updated guidance in 2016, which still holds good, um, I think reflects the concern that too much of an anti-litigation stance um, was abounding um, and, and concerns that sort of reputation and PR issues might put charities under pressure to settle claims, even where the claims are weak. And that really will conflict with a trustee's overriding duties to act in the best interests of its charity and preserve assets for charity wherever possible. So I think the correct emphasis now and the approach now as recognised by the Commission is what is in the charity's best interest, as we said, and usually that will translate into only pursuing litigation, and by that I mean formal court proceedings, where other routes have been explored, such as mediation, and that's enshrined in this 2016 guidance, the, the duty to explore uh, alternative dispute resolution. So the char what charity mu trustees must do under the guidance is to consider the prospects of success or failure of the claim and ask a lawyer to make a prospects assessment. So if the claim is very weak, it's going to be a charity trustee's duty to defend um, the claim and take steps to manage um, the, the claim cost effectively. Um, if you decide to elect to defend a claim, you aren't committing your charity to a trial. There are several stages along the way before trial, happily, and several um, opportunities for settlement. Um, most claims, in truth, can be settled at mediation or even through um, an exchange of without prejudice correspondence. I'd say sort of 95% of the cases I deal with settle in those ways and often without the need for any court proceedings to be issued or even if they are issued, for those proceedings to be stayed whilst um, dispute resolution methods are explored. Um, mediation can often take place at an early stage without prejudicing the party's interests. Once the initial fact finding and investigative work has been carried out and there's been an exchange of a letter of claim and a letter of response, the principal arguments in the case ought to have been identified. And although the parties might be far apart in their positions, the instruction of a mediator and particularly one who has specific experience of contested estates can bring about settlement, even in cases where settlement appears a dim and distant hope. So plainly, what is the value of the legacy and how much is at stake will be the primary consideration. Um, trustees ought to conduct an early cost benefit analysis of the likelihood that the legacy could be returned to the charity in full if the claim which threatens it is entirely unsuccessful against the cost, time and resources that will be incurred in defending the claim. So there may be cases where it is appropriate and actually necessary to take a case to trial, particularly if the legacy is high value. Um, I have a case on at present where, although we still obviously hope to avoid trial, we're acting for a charity for whom the testator had a fond affection and a close association to, and the charity stands to receive the bulk of the three million pound estate after payment of a few low value legacies. So the claimant is um, uh, claiming as a dependent under the 1975 Act, asserting that she was being maintained by the deceased at the date of her death the result, as a result of a handful of payments of fairly modest sums towards the claimant's care having been made to the claimant by the deceased in the months leading up to her death. And we've advised the charity client that the claim is weak, has weak merit. 
because there's no evidence that the deceased had a long-standing wish for the claimant to benefit substantially from the estate. So the claim is for a sum approaching half a million pounds, inclusive of costs. And the costs um, for the charity of defending the claim to trial might amount to £100,000 or thereabouts, possibly a little bit more. But those costs are proportionate to the value of um, you know, potentially dismissing the claim entirely and would also be recoverable from the claimant personally if the charity's defence is successful. So what we're doing, and we've already done, in fact, is to advise our client to make an offer to compromise the claim. And that offer has been put forward on um, a without prejudice uh, basis. The offer is lower than the cost that would be incurred in taking the case to trial. And that's on the basis of seeking to achieve a cost saving to the charity and because the claim has a nuisance value and it, the offer factors in litigation risk for the claimant, which we say is, is serious and high um, and the risk that the claim will not succeed at all. So um, we will we await a response to that offer, but we are we are hopeful, having put forward the persuasive arguments in, in the um, in the letter of response as to why the claim will fail, that we ought to achieve a swift settlement. On that particular case, we're also having to rein in the executor's solicitors who are getting quite excited and proposing to pursue against the claimant's daughter um, recovery of other sums to the estate, which aren't very um, valuable, um, but they're pursuing them on the basis that the um, payments to the daughter were made at a point where the deceased capacity was doubtful. Um, it doesn't appear at the moment that the costs of the executor pursuing recovery of the sums due to the estate, from which we, as the charity residuary beneficiary, would ultimately benefit, but it doesn't appear that those costs would be proportionate to the value of the sums that the executor hopes to recover. And the executor owes a duty to our residuary beneficiary charity to act commercially and sensibly. So, um, in other words, the executors aren't duty bound to pursue these claims at further costs to the estate. Um, which we would ultimately bear, um, our client would ultimately bear. So just very quickly and conscious of time and needing to allow time for questions, can I have my next slide? And I just wanted to say that, you know, the, the approach is always to try and settle these claims if we possibly can. Um, because if your um, charity is joined as a party to the claim, um, and uh, proceedings are issued, there'll be a form called an acknowledgement of service in which you have to tick a box confirming whether or not the charity is going to take steps to actually defend the claim or not, or simply stand back and be bound by whatever the court may decide. And if electing to actively defend the time limits for indicating this and preparing the charity's evidence in response are short and usually not longer than 21 or 28 days, so the charity needs to be prepared to act swiftly in taking legal advice and doing the cost benefit analysis. So top tips for preparing claims are, as soon as you become aware of your entitlement, gather all available evidence as to the association, the testate or how does your charity. Um, so it's less likely, as I've said, for a court to make an order disrupting a legacy if there's a long history of close association with your charity or a good reason why your charity was chosen as a beneficiary. Be prepared to analyse and summarise in a witness statement why the legacy income is of value to your charity and what projects it will help you to complete in particular. Agree to mediate the claim wherever possible and actively press for this. Um, mediation can often be arranged at short notice of a few weeks. Um, and there's the potential for the court to impose cost sanctions on any party that unreasonably refuses to mediate. So the more you press it and the more the other side refuse, the more reasonable your charity looks and the more cost pressure is being put on that claimant. Um, team up with other charity legatees to share the costs and burden of all this. Elect a lead beneficiary to run the situation and to liaise with the lawyers. Um, carefully document the trustee's reasons for deciding to defend the claim or not to or deciding not to defend the claim. Um, so, you know, if the trustees are minded not to defend, they will be giving up an asset of the charity. So they should be satisfied that they have good reasons for doing so and record those reasons in case they're asked to justify the um, decision. So overall, in conclusion, the charity commission expects trustees to consider le legal action um, only after they've explored and ruled out any other ways of resolving the issues in dispute. So charities should not be afraid to assert their rights to legacies. You know, legacies are a very, very vital source of income, um, a source of income stream available to charities. And a decision to actively defend a claim doesn't necessarily carry with it adverse cost consequences, providing the charity acts reasonably in its defence. Um, 
the cost benefit analysis is essential, but charities should be comforted by the fact that the civil procedure rules, which are the, the rules governing litigation, allow a charity to take a diplomatic approach to help avoid any perception that the charity has forced the matter to go to court. Um, if the charity files a neutral defence asserting the intentions of the testator in relation to the legacy and then proposes mediation at an early stage, that will limit costs and it ought to achieve, if successful, a negotiated solution that ensures maximum recovery of the charity's costs from the estate. So that is really all I wanted to say about the ways in which these disputes can be managed. Um, it's quite a lot in there, I appreciate, but very happy to take questions as are other members of our panel. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Lucy. Um, so um, we've got a, a, a few minutes uh, left to go and we're, we're happy to hang on. Um, if anyone's got any uh, questions, feel free to, to unmute yourself uh, and ask them out loud. Or if you prefer, you can write them in the Q&A box. So I will open the floor. Whilst people are uh, thinking, Stu, maybe it's worth us just um, recounting the brief conversation that we were having before around the fraud risk, because mm. although the fraud risk isn't specifically um, a, a, attached to disputes, actually in the environment that we're in and actually going forward, the environment that we're about to, to uh, live within with cost of living crisis, etc., there is an increased risk of fraud generally, and that legacy dispute uh, legacies are, are no different in terms of being um, open to that as a vehicle for that fraud absolutely thanks karen and indeed our very own um, sadir singh has asked the exact same question uh, so you must be uh, in the same room or something um with him um <clears throat> so um in terms of that yeah uh, there, there was a report out uh, well an article out yesterday wasn't there um talking about the increase um uh, levels of fraud being uh um, occurring uh, in in legacies. I know, Lucy, you had uh, some some thoughts on that in terms of uh, yeah, the I, numbers. I, indeed, I mean, I think you know, fraud is something we need to be aware of. Certainly, um, I think that the case that was widely reported following the um, Institute of Legacy Management Conference the other day, the, um, the case where the executor had actually you know defrauded the estate by transferring property into their own name, is, is still quite an extreme situation i mean those aren't cases that we come across every day but yes sadly there is scope for for fraud and it, it all really comes back to this sort of immediate and direct communication with the executors and prs upon becoming aware that you know you are a beneficiary a charity is a beneficiary of an estate and requiring information i mean um you know Fraud is, is, is obviously a very serious allegation. There are obviously criminal prosecution routes available to charities other than the formal civil litigation. Um, if there was good evidence of, of fraud, you know, prosecution might be the way to go, perhaps as a dovetail to the civil litigation aspects. Um, but I think it was really interesting how, you know, the, the sort of the fraud only came to light following um, looking at a sort of a little entry in, a, in one of the some of the estate accounts. You know, pouring over estate accounts isn't always an easy job. Um, and, you know, it, there is potential for these things to 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 be hidden. Um, but but I think, you know, so asking for explanations of things that you don't understand, you know, don't be afraid to ask what you might feel is a stupid question, because look, what you know, what this this question on a very basic point, you know, £350 legal advice actually led to uncovering in that case. I mean, I think, you know, if you don't understand something, don't be afraid to make the inquiry. And am I right in saying this? You know, sometimes mm. I think some some charities there's an element of uh, gratefulness in terms of you know they've they've got something that exactly. uh, could be quite significant to them. Do you ever feel that there's a sort of instance where they they feel you know almost beholden to the executors and and you know um, almost. Yeah, that that's largely what's at play. I mean, they feel extremely grateful and humbled by the bequests and you know it's it's difficult to take a robust stance against a family member who appears to be you know in, in dire straits i mean it's it's tricky um so there is always this balance to be struck between um you know securing for your charity assets intended for it i think you know it always really helps to reassure uh, boards of trustees and, and clients that really you are only upholding 
seeking to uphold what the testator wanted to achieve. And um, you know, if there is a meritorious claim, then, then it ought to be settled and it can be settled cost effectively. But it doesn't mean that you know, charities should feel that they, they have no say in the matter or should just sort of um, give in at the first um, hurdle because it really will potentially, I mean, it's important to appreciate, conflict with the, the overriding duties of the trustees, um, attracting potentially personal liability. And when the sums are large, that's pretty serious consideration. Oh, here we go, we've got a, um, yeah. another question. Ah, <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, Jerry. Oh, yeah. great, sorry. Um, this is a, probably a stupid question, but our auditors a few weeks ago actually brought up the issue of fraud in legacy. So they're taking mm. a real close look at it. And I said, to them, great, okay, let me pose a problem to you. So often we'll get a will through Smee and Ford or whatever they're called anymore. And it will say, you're going to get £10,000 only if the... Um, the individual wasn't predeceased by her husband or her brother's sister and what have you. Um, and quite often we have real difficulty proving that that person is still alive and that's the reason we're not getting anything. Um, mm. That probably sounds like a, I'm probably wording my question wrong and I'm, I'm apologising. No, no. But I said to the auditors... How do I prove, get proof, and I'll, I'll write perhaps with the executors, but if I don't write back, how do I prove that actually the husband, the brother, the sister, or someone is still alive, which is why we're mm. not getting anything from that particular will? I suppose a search of the um, register of deaths ought to reveal. Well, no, it won't, because a person who registers with death yeah. won't always be that family member. No, but I mean, but if the person that you suspect might not be alive is still alive, they won't be registered as deceased. No, right. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm wording this really badly. So we get a will that says Joe Bloggs is dead. You're going to get £10,000 as long as Mary Bloggs is already dead. We don't get anything. So we try to find out. Are we not getting anything because the executors have kept it? Or are we not getting it because Mary Bloggs is actually still living? And it may not be the wife, the husband, the brother, but it could be my best friend, Joe, down, down the road. And it was something our auditors um, actually said, oh, you've got a point there. We didn't think about that. And majority of the time, we write to the executors and they'll write back and say, yes, the husband's still alive or the wife's still alive, blah, blah, mm. blah. We accept that. But sometimes we don't hear anything back. Mm. I've thrown it out there. Well, I apologise okay. because you're doing exactly what our auditors did. Hmm. Don't know. Not sure. So I'm sorry, I, I just sort of think that... Um... I don't know if I, you misunderstood on my comment, and forgive me if I'm not making myself clear, but um, if you, you receive nothing back from the executors, you, and, but you suspect that perhaps you're not receiving anything because somebody is still alive, a, your own search of the register of deaths would assist because if your search did not reveal a death of the person that is perhaps still alive, then you can assume that they are still alive, and that is the reason. Yes, but if you, when you say the register of deaths, I'm being really yes. ignorant here. I do a search on probate, but right. if that person had died and obviously didn't leave anything in their will, it wouldn't throw them up, would it? No, so I, I mean, I mean the sort of general. Stuart, do you know what I mean? Are you able to? I, say do, I do. I, th I think, uh, Jerry, in your example, you gave. Um, that the, the male had died and Mary was uh, a, a potential um, a, a life tenant, shall we say. Yeah, correct, yes. So uh, Mary is, uh, we do the search of the register of deaths for Mary, she's not there. Mm -hmm. So Lucy's argument is you can make the assumption uh, that she's still alive. Your point, Jerry, there is, well, if I go into Mary, when Mary does die, um, mm -hmm. she will have a will, but it won't mention me in it. No, it won't. Um, but mm -hmm. essentially that's when entitlement passes to you. So the response to you is, is, is simply now that you're aware of that legacy, you just have to keep a roving brief 
on the registers of death such that when you do see her name come up um then you then get back in contact with yeah yeah the executors um yeah. yeah, so if Mary was a life tenant or something entitled to the income and you only get an interest on death, as Stuart was running through in his example, mm-hmm. then then I, I understand what you're saying and that would be the way to find out. It would keep be keeping a roving brief on if, yeah. if you have no other source of information yeah. on the registry. Yeah. Uh, but but in terms of that point, Jerry, if, if, they, if Mary was on the register of deaths, then that is pointing yes. towards... Uh, a potential fraud so Agreed. i would say walking in there with the underlying assumption that there is fraud i would go the other way and say well actually until i've got evidence to suggest there is a fraud then i wouldn't take too much further action no uh, if i just explain the reason i said this to the auditors i said right if i was dodgy then i would have a legacy for the hospice that says we're going to get ten thousand pounds as long as mary's died Um, I then, I know Mary's dead, so I write to this company, I pocket that money, and I say, and I'll say to you, the reason I pocket it is because, sorry, the reason we haven't got anything is Mary's still alive. I'll stop there because I'm getting myself wrapped in knots over something that's probably not a problem. So, um, yeah, I I, I think Lucy's point about looking at the register of deaths, I think that that will sway you one way or the other, Jerry. If you know the person's date of birth and full details, yeah, yeah. Well, it should be written in the will. So in the will will of Tom, in the will of Tom, it will say, I bequest to Mary of such and such address and date of birth nine times. Ah, some of them I've seen. If that will has been drafted well. Right. Okay. Thank you both very much. No worries. Okay. I think Mary's got a question. Uh, If executives of our individuals are not solicitors and are not responding to communications, is it possible to access the will or the estate accounts. Who wants to field that one? I fear that's another legal question for you. <laughs> so, yeah. Or Lucy. So this is tricky because some exec- uh, some individuals who are not um, solicitors, who are executors, sit on their hands if they don't really like what the will says and they don't do anything to administer the estate because they don't like it or they're enjoying a proper an estate asset and they're quite happy with the status quo. So you can you can do a search for a copy of a will, but only when um, there's been a well. There's various people called Certainty Will Search is is a good place to start as a plug for them if, if ever there needed to be one. You can do a search of certain registers for for um, for wills, but usually the wills only published at the point of the grant of probate or grants of letters of administration being obtained. And so if nobody's taken any steps to obtain the grant of probate, you may struggle to obtain a copy of the will. If, and it depends on your status as well as, um, so you're only entitled to see the will if you're a beneficiary of the estate. And you're only entitled to estate accounts detailing all the assets of the estate if you're a residuary beneficiary of the estate. So if you're just a legatee of of a small sum, you're not entitled to detailed estate accounts from the executors in the first place. If you are a residuary beneficiary, you can apply um, for a, and it's actually, it it is an application to court but it is a short form application to court that doesn't cost very much money um, for what's called an action for an inventory and account of estate assets. And I'm talking sort of a few hundred, maybe a thousand pounds type of costs rather than sort of lots of thousands of pounds to get that application off the ground. Um, But obviously you should start with a letter that says um, you are obliged, if you believe um, you are a beneficiary of the um, estate, to supply a copy of the will, please do so. So there's some pre-action work that's been done there. You can show you've, you've done any of everything you possibly can to um, obtain a copy of the will without, um, uh, sorry, and the estate assets details without going to court. But there are ways and means. Okay. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, I think that concludes our webinar. There are no other uh, questions in the Q&A bit so thank you very much all attending and thank you very much to our speakers Lucy, Karen and Alice. Uh, Do take care everybody and we hope to see you soon. Bye for now.